Hello and good evening, everyone. I welcome you to day four of our virtual program on changing perceptions of childhood and children's literature. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Professor Geetanjali Singh Chanda, who is an associate professor at Ashoka University. And it's lovely uh, to have you, ma'am, uh, with us today. How thank are you? you? Very well, thank you. And it's such a pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so today, uh, Ma'am's uh, deliberation is titled From Words to Films. And it's, it's like, uh, you know, we have been talking about uh, books and we have been talking about novels, stories, uh, fiction, uh, nonfiction. But uh, today is all about telling stories and Ma'am's deliberation won't be restricted to words we are going to move to films. And I must say, uh, you know, uh, first when uh, a book is written, maybe there is some kind of a visual image in the mind of the writer. So from a visual image, we move to words. And then when, uh, you know, a story would be made into a film. So from words, again, we move to uh, films. And nowadays we even have, uh, you know, video games. And if we talk about virtual storytelling, even video games are made into films. Uh, I remember I used to play Mario Brothers, uh, you know, when I was uh, younger. And uh, now uh, I was just reading that uh, there are three movies based on that uh, video game. Uh, and uh, the latest one is going to be released in 2023. So this is really exciting. Uh, and, uh, you know, ma'am's talk is titled Telling Stories from Words to Films. So without wasting any more time, I would now request uh, our Joint Secretary, uh, IFES, Shri Priya ma'am, to introduce the guest to the audience. Please, ma'am. Uh, hi, hello, everyone. And a uh, very good evening, a very warm welcome. And I'm so delighted to welcome you all here. Today we have uh, our uh, guest speaker of the session, Dr. Geetanjali Singh Chanda on telling stories, words to films. Almost every one of us is so familiar with some of the stories or the other because we grew up listening to our parents or grannies or from our surroundings. Stories are inseparable from humankind. Skilled storytelling, illustrations, animation drawings attract children and even adults to read uh, a book to, or even to watch a film with passion. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker, Dr. Geetanjali Singh Chanda. She's currently working as an associate professor in the Department of English at Ashoka University, Haryana. Previously, she was a senior lecturer in the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies program at Yale University, where she taught over, over 15 years. She pursued her Doctor of Philosophy in English Literature at Hong Kong University, and she did her master's degree from George Washington University. Her research interests include children's literature, women's writings, feminist and transcultural pedagogy, Sikh writing and films, Bollywood, popular culture, masculinity, and religion. She is the author of Indian Women in the House of Fiction, published by Zuban. Thank you all for joining us. And definitely you'll be having a great takeaway from this session. And it will be a fruitful session also. And uh, followed by our the guest talk, uh, there is a question and answer session. I request uh, all of you just uh, raise your hand. There is an option which is given uh, next to the record. So use that, just raise your hand so that we can, uh, we will put uh, put your questions or you can ask directly your question to the uh, guest or even you can just put your message in the chat box. We are looking forward for your participation and now the floor is your open to our speaker. Please, ma'am. Thank you, Shripia, for that warm welcome. Before I start, let me first acknowledge my thanks 
to my niece, Amrita Chanda, and her daughter, Malika, who are responsible for the slides that you are going to see. And if you like the slides, all credit goes to them rather than to me. Thank you. Next. I must, next slide. I must thank Shatarupa ma'am and IFEST for the privilege of attending and participating in this exciting festival. The discussions have been insightful and original and very relaxed at, as Shatarupa pointed out. So I hope we can continue with that relaxed atmosphere on day four, as we did on days one and two also. Um, Isha Ma'am, the president of IFEST, noted that often when we talk about children's literature, children are in fact left out. So the interviews of the children and their participation was a fantastic addition to this six day festival. Um, and also the notion of literature has been expanded to not only include poetry and the rest, but also as Shavlin noted, video games. And Shotarupa Ma'am just mentioned that video games are so important to children's learning and education now. Um, so thank you all so much, all the team at IFEST, for making this such a unique festival from its very conception. My job is to take you on a journey. And the journey is from text, oral and written, to illustrations and films in children's literature. Next slide, please. Ma'am, I shall start presenting the screen now. Uh, perhaps, yeah. uh, you know, it would be nice uh, if you uh, just tell me, uh, Shatrupa, to the next slide so that uh, yeah. you know, when I hear it, I I'll will. get the cue to move. Yeah. Thank you. I'll just present. I will. Screen. Okay. So this was supposed to be the slide where you heard me thank everyone and so forth. So now we can move to the next slide, which is the John Locke style slide. Shatrupa, next. Hang yes, on. Something it's there. Is can, you, can you see it? Can you see this? Yeah, slide? I can see it. Yes. I can but I can't see anything else. So just give me one second. The slide is taking up the whole. Okay. Um... It's not letting me see anything else that I want to see. Okay. As okay, long as uh, you can see. Do you, uh, do you want to ask um, someone uh, if they can help you with, with it? Actually, no, no, when I'm I... fine. Let me just. Okay. Let me just carry on and we can yes. take it from there, okay? Whoops, it's gone again. Okay, so let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a man called John Locke. One day he got a letter from a friend saying, my wife and I have just had a baby. Please could you tell us how we should bring up this child? Locke who was an English philosopher and physician, put on his thinking cap and jotted down some thoughts on children's education. One of his most important ideas, next slide, Shatajuta, was what he thought the chill, one of his most important ideas was that he Can thought- I have the in a no, Sorry, can you hear me? 
Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. I, I would uh, just uh -huh. request Sri Priya, ma'am, please keep a tab on the other participants. And if uh, somehow they are unmuted, please, please mute them. Please, Sri sure, Priya. Ma ma yes, ma'am. Okay. Please go ahead, ma'am. Sorry. Uh, one of his most important ideas was that he thought that chil children were born as tabula rasa, a clean slate. There was nothing on their minds when they came into the world and gradually they gathered experiences and the clean slate was written upon next slide please since i can't see the slides can you just signal to me that you've changed it Shatarupa, did you change the slide? Just a minute, ma'am. Okay. Yes, purpose of children's literature. That is a slide we are on now. No, what is children's literature? Okay. It's the next one, maybe. I gave you the wrong thing to change. So yes. what is yes. children's literature? As I said earlier, as uh, has been pointed out, that children's literature is not by or even necessarily for children. It is the first written, it is first written and chosen by adults parents, teachers, etc. But what alerts then us to the fact that a book is a children's book? Anyone? Any ideas? So one simple thing is simple style. Children's books are very simply written and the focus is on action. In earlier times, children's books were very focused on teaching. They were didactic and they taught morals and good behavior. Next slide, please. So what then is the purpose of children's literature? The purpose of children's literature, as Locke had stated also, was to instruct and delight. It woke their imagination and took them on adventures. And as in one of the panels, Niharika said, it created empathy in children. It, of course, taught culture to children too. So children grew up learning the values of their culture, as we do through myths and legends like the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, etc. Next slide, please. One of the important other thinkers for children and children's literature was Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And he wanted children to learn almost without being taught as such. They should learn joyously and naturally. And you see how even very little children will turn anything into a toy, pots, pans, etc. They're figuring out the world and they are fig figuring out the materi materiality of objects. They watch, understand, and learn to use, sometimes by imitation. They learn how things are done in their homes and cultures. Kids should not be burdened with the overt moral lessons, Rousseau said, because they're not ready for it. Children he thought is reason sleep. Next slide, please. So Locke and Rousseau were the early thinkers who taught us about childhood studies and children's literature. Locke particularly felt children should be taught via entertainment. Learning has to be sugar-coated by entertainment for children to be attracted to books and to other lessons they are taught. Next slide. 
John Newbery is known as the grandfather of children's literature. He implemented Locke and Rousseau's ideas. He made books pleasant to look at. He added illustrations and colors. And now there is a Newbery Award that you see on the right of the slide, I hope, that is given to the best books in various categories every year. And of course, the pictures or illustrations have improved with each leap in technology. Just as in the early days, we moved from oral stories to written texts, the quality of our illustrations has also um, become better. Next slide, please. These are some of the books written and produced by Newbery. These were amongst the first illustrated books meant especially for children. Next slide. But before we can really talk about children's literature, we should ask ourselves, what is childhood? In the 17th century, for instance, children were considered miniature adults. They were expected to behave like mini adults and dressed like adults too. You remember the phrase, children are meant to be seen and not heard? Well, that's what was happening. Children didn't have voices. They were not meant to interact or talk to people. They were just there as little showpieces. And around the 18th century, we did not see many books aimed at children specifically. Next slide. So, we can see that the first children's books were published around 740, 1740, sorry. Interestingly, many adult books were reframed for children. The lang uh, what do we call them, abridged versions now that many of our students read and many adults read too. And now, as was pointed out, I think by Shatarupa Ma'am, Supposed children's books like Harry Potter were also widely read by adults. So the categories of children's books and adult books have also become quite fluid. So not only the distinction between adult and child, but also the distinct distinction between adult books and children's books have become fluid. And in any case, this question was asked to Shwata Ma'am yesterday or in one of the panels. These categories are mainly decided by librarians and teachers. Very often they're classified according to age also, so that when you walk into a bookshop or a library, you know exactly where to go. And our notions of what are children's books and what are adult books, you can see immediately because they have been separated physically on library shelves. Next slide, please. These are just some examples of books to give us an idea of how far we have come, not only in terms of illustrations, but also in terms of subject matter. These are very modern new books, which um, reflect the variety, the political correctness, the, the very ethos of society now. I think I want to stop here for a minute, just to ask anyone if you have any questions and we can go to that. Ma'am, should I stop sharing the slides at this moment for a while? Um, and then I can do it again when you no, Whatever, or you can hold it at the slide where we are. 
Okay, so Shri Priya ma'am, whatever you can do, I fine. cannot see uh, actually uh, if participants have raised their hands. I cannot see it. If you can see it, maybe you can call out the participants if they want to say anything at this point. Good evening, ma'am. Can I ask a question? Please. Okay, ma'am. It's a really a great thing that I am a part of this. And one question that I would like to ask is whether it was men or women who had started writing the children book. in its origin so who sympathized with that childhood what? phase more whether it was the woman because she is the nurturer and the mother or the father or the men who are the uh, who take who takes care of the entire household and the family thank you ma'am for giving me this opportunity what a great question could you tell me your name also yes ma'am my name is shomita sarkar and i am working as a pgt english in jawahar navodaya vidyalaya in uh, patan uh -huh. district of gujarat ma'am thank you shomita so shomita that's a really good question and you know in the time of isap and the fables it was normally the slaves and women who told these stories to children they were not written down at that stage so when it comes to who had more sympathy it's a sort of difficult question because those who read the stories to the children because how that's how they first um appreciated these stories were the ones who influenced the children most in terms of who wrote and published these stories the records tell us as far as i know that it was the men it was lock and russo who thought about what is children's literature and how should it be and it was newbery who implemented that so in all these cases it was the men who got the credit for doing that at least in terms of um, what we have as a record thank you so much ma'am for enlightening no. us ma'am thank you so much ma'am anyone else okay can we have the next slide then yes ma'am okay so thanks to lock russo and newbery the ideas of including the pleasure principle in children's books we now have board games and three dimensional books and um you know those feely books with fur and all that on them and the cutouts within the animals where you have the mouth and there's a cutout and you can the child can put his finger or her finger through it those are thanks to the ideas of a uh, lock russo newbery newbery is the one who actually implemented these ideas next slide please so the question i posed to myself is so can we count comics as children's literature but the other day at one of the panels i was amazed to hear of video games being discussed as children's literature and um when when we were talking earlier uh shatarupa also said the same thing that video games are great and video games have been made into movies but do they really can they really be counted as children's literature and i thought about this and i thought why not the world has changed and video games and commercial films have also become a very important part of children's education for example when the students were being interviewed pritam said that he learned about responsibility from a film like home alone and again i asked why not although when i first heard it i must say i was a bit shocked thinking how can you consider a commercial film like home again as children's literature 
books and comics have become a part of a child's reading internationally. The first comic appeared in 1847. So now we include comics in the category of children's literature also. Next slide, please. So we have known comics only like Batman, Superman, Captain America, etc. But what we are seeing now is the vast popularity of the Japanese manga and the Korean manhwa comics, which are known by the youth the world over. Their popularity has surpassed that of American comics. Next slide, please. So yesterday, I was so happy to hear Shatarupa Ma'am talk about Satyajit Ray and his stories for children. I feel the Indian context in children's literature has left a huge lack. There has not been enough discussion or enough writing on children's literature in India regional literature, as well as whatever else you want to include in it. And we must therefore not forget when we talk about comics of our own Amar Chitra Katha. The ACK comics. Let me tell you a story about Anand Pai, the creator of Amar Chitra Katha. Has everyone heard of Amar Chitra Katha? Yes, yes. ma'am. We grew up reading Amar Chitra Katha and Tinkle. Okay. Yes. So um, some of you may know this story of why and how Anant Pai um, started the Amar Chitra Katha. He said he went to a quiz show around this time of year, many years ago, and the students were so quick to answer questions about Greek mythology and um, Western stories. But when he asked them, who was Ram's father? Not a single hand went up. He was so shocked and so disappointed that he said, how can we teach children about our own literature and culture. And remember, part of the work that uh, children's literature does is to acculturate children, to teach them about their literature, their history, their heroes, and so forth. So then who was Amar Chitra Katha aimed at? Who was it written for? Any guesses? No. Initially, my quiz story should have given it away. Initially, Amar Chitra Katha was, made, was aimed at Indian children in India to teach them their history and culture. But remember, the very first ACK comics were not written in any regional language or in Hindi. They were written in English. So they were appealing to a middle to upper middle class audience because the language gives it away. Who spoke English in those days? Uh, those days means the 60s. So people of a certain class spoke English, the others did not. But very soon, these comics, the ACK comics, were in very high demand by, can you guess who? NRIs, non-resident Indians, went for Amar Chitra Katha like they were Mithai. Why? Because they wanted their children to have some connection with India, although they were not living in India. 
they felt they were losing out. Their children were becoming strangers to them because they had none of the background of Indian culture and mythology. So on day two, when Shatarupa Ma'am interjected and told us the stories, children's stories by Satyaji Tre, I, I was really thrilled thinking, you know, these are the authors that we should know more about. And there are so many of them now who are writing both in regional languages and in English, but showing us the Indian background and atmosphere. And one of a couple of my favorite, I don't want to pinpoint only one, is Ranjit Lal's um, The Battle for Number 19. And in my class, we've had a lot of discussion about this because the battle for number 19 is set around the killing of Mrs. Gandhi and the subsequent massacre of the Sikhs. This is in a way fairly graphically described. There are no pictures in this, but it's graphically described in the text. So I was asking the students, what do you think about this? Should it be taught to children or not? And they were all of the opinion that it was very important to teach this to children because it was a moment in history that they needed to know about, although they were not even born then. Um, but it was something that they needed to know about and therefore uh, it was essential to learn about it. So we've, next slide, please. You know, I keep asking you any questions, so please just speak up if you have a question. It's very boring to hear one voice all the time. Yes, so now my... we are on a very interesting uh, page of your uh, <laughs> presentation. Yeah. So this slide um, gives you another question of graphic novels versus comics. These days we talk about graphic novels and in India particularly, it's a huge market for graphic novels. But the first couple of graphic novels were Spiegelman's Mouse and uh, Satrapi's, what is it called? Satra Maja Persepolis. Persepolis. <laughs> right, thank you. And what was amazing about both these is that they are very serious subjects. They deal with the Holocaust at one level and at the other level, the, um, the takeover and brutality of the regime against Ira normal Iranians, but specifically women. And we are seeing that today also. So when we see Persepolis today, we see it with a very different lens. Spiegelman, for instance, insisted that Mouse was a comic. He did not want the supposed dignity and seriousness of calling it a graphic novel. And both Mouse and Persepolis have been made into films. Uh, so it's worth seeing the journey of these books into films also. In the middle of this slide, you see Asterix. Asterix was a French comic and it did the same work that other comics did, but in a more serious way, because like Amar Chitra Katha, um, Asterix um, transferred knowledge to its readers. The reader, readers of Amar Chitra Katha uh, about 10 years ago, five years ago, said they learned all their history from Amar Chitra Katha. ACK was taken as um, the truth, not just a comic. And they verified uh, 
um, Anant Pai verified every detail, he says, in Amarchitra Katha. Now we could talk about Amarchitra Katha and its downside and its Hindutva agenda, as some have seen it. Uh, Nandini Chandra, for instance, has said that um, it's a very uh, brainwashing kind of work. But that said, it did teach uh, the children history. And Anantpai was very conscious of these criticisms. So very quickly, he brought out uh, stories of Guru Nanak, of Mirabai, of Jesus Christ, all these people in his Amarchitra Kathas. Next slide. So we see that the lines are blurring between what is adult and children's literature and also the various genres of literature. We are now unable to put them in silos and say, this is a comic and therefore it's not children's literature, or this is the Mario film which Shatrupa Mam is waiting for, and that's not children's literature. Because in a way, all this is children's literature. Next slide. So what we see happening is the stretching of mediums, largely due to competition. And also, remember earlier I had said that this literature is uh, chosen for children by their parents, written by adults, etc. Adults, in a way, had colonized children. But now children are making their own choices and they are heard more. So they have become a market that has to be accounted for. How many times have you ch seen children drag their parents to a bookshop or library and say, I don't want that, I want this book. And that um, has given them a say in the kind of works they read. And children's books now are less literary and reflective. They are more dynamic, they are more interactive. Uh, you have uh, storytelling in the books. You have adult stories transformed into books, etc. Next slide. So this is just to show you, we all know Disney, but this is just to show you that the magic of technology has made films far more popular than they ever were. And before Disney, these short films were already in circulation. Next slide, please. We're coming to the end. So this is your time to ask questions. So Disney's first films, uh, Snow White, etc., Aladdin, etc., were huge successes. One proof of this is that in the panel the other evening, our own Laksha admitted to watching Frozen seven times. So the attraction of Disney is phenomenal. Um, many people have watched these Disney films very, very frequently. And Disney itself has changed. Disney used to have passive heroines who were waiting for the Prince Charming to come and rescue them. And now, in a film like Frozen, there is no Prince Charming who's coming. If I remember correctly, it's the sister who saves her other sister and the sisters are independent. So the attraction of Disney is phenomenal, partly because it changes with time. It hasn't gone to sleep, even though Disney himself passed away a while ago, um, his successor has taken over and um, pushed Disney even more than before. 
Next slide, please. So what we see now, and this is slightly worrying, at least for me, is the Disney empire. Disney in the 1950s opened amusement parks. We now have Disney toys, t-shirts, memorabilia, and Disney has become dominant, dominant and hegemonic. When we think of children's cinema, uh, it's Disney. And I don't want to diss uh, Disney in any way because Disney made, revived the old fairy tales of Grimm's brothers and Hansel and Gretel and all that by making them into films. People, children had stopped reading those, but the minute Disney took over and made them into films, everybody was back and everybody knew the stories of Snow White, Cinderella, Red Riding Hood, etc. So Disney's influence has been quite phenomenal, even though dominant. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorite film studios, which is Studio Ghibli. It's a Japanese film studio. They've done many, well, not many, they've done five to seven films. And um, Miyazaki, who started this studio, explained that I created a heroine who is an ordinary girl someone with whom the audience can sympathize. And that is really a wonderful thing about Ghibli, that students, people who are watching, um, em empathize with that. And one of the students, and I can't remember her name, said the whole point of reading children's literature is that it creates empathy. So both films and children's literature of any kind can create sympathy. And what Ghibli Studio does is that it does not have these over the top cartoon characters. It has very gentle people who go on various adventures, but are aware of their connection with nature, with the earth, with the spirits, very Japanese in its feelings. Um, so if nothing else, I hope you will see my neighbor Tortoro or one of these other Ghibli Studio films before your minds get completely dominated by Disney, however wonderful Disney may be. Next slide, please. Okay, and this was the last slide. So, any questions? Thank you so much, ma'am. I'm sure our participants are ready with questions. Glincy. Uh, please go ahead uh, with your question. Um, hello, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Um, thank you, ma'am, for that uh, wonderful lecture. So I just wanted to ask, uh, you talked about ch uh, children's literature and childhood studies. So at present, we have a lot of work that is being done on children, uh, both from the context of childhood studies. So how much do you think can we say that children have an agency because no matter what we do, we still look at them from an adult position. So is it possible to say that even in childhood studies, when we do it, is it possible to, you know, to give an agency to the child? And my second question would be, uh, you talked about uh, the children's literature that was produced in India. So in a way, like, are, uh, shouldn't we be emphasizing more on the caste class uh, reflections that was being brought out and it was which which they which they used as a medium you know to infiltrate into children's mind to uphold it so in a way uh, how much do you think can 
a child have an agency in both these aspects one from the adults and secondly especially in india where we have the caste and class issues which are found in the children's literature but is being uh, paid very le- less attention to thank you ma'am actually you're very right and that's a very thoughtful question when you look at even our epics um the ramayan the mahabharat they have issues of caste do we want to highlight those and teach them to children or do we not i don't have an answer it depends on whoever is teaching it i think though that it's such an important part of the indian ethos that we should be teaching that if nothing else then at least to critique it in the panels uh, yesterday somebody said when we watch films or books we do it with a critical eye um i'm not sure we do i don't i'm not sure we either teach or learn with a critical eye um because sometimes and i'm going to give you an example from the other course i teach which is bollywood and gender bollywood has so filled our minds with entertainment value and with um, ideologies that we are not even aware of bollywood films are so misogynist so anti woman so anti caste we've hardly had more than a handful of films on caste and even there we are looking at caste from the perspective of an upper caste person i don't know there's a value to teaching it only so that we can talk about it and discuss it otherwise it gets shoved under the carpet bollywood is not pure entertainment bollywood is in our very blood stream as the ideologies we have imbibed children's literature also when i ask my students what do they remember of the first books that they read the first books that they read were enid blyton and the rest none of them for the for the most part can generalize on this had read any other some bengali students had read satyajit ray um but that was about it no marathi no gujarati no any other story so already our minds are imbued with western literature western culture western ideologies and all books have ideologies i think there's not a single book without an ideology if we agree the, with the ideology we say this is normal if we don't agree with it um and we are reading it without a critical eye we think oh this is very biased but there is no such thing as an objective work i think does that answer your question at all oh yes ma'am yes yes uh, i just okay. wanted to add that since children's literature at least in the pedagogical system this has to be highlighted because Yeah, at least uh, mainly in the pedagogical or the curriculum that we see these are not emphasized enough it like yeah. uh, as you just said we are not informed readers yeah. it's just the literature children's literature so i think more uh, emphasis should be given in the pedagogical aspects uh, so absolutely thank, yeah thank you ma'am thank you for answering my question yeah thank you glincy for your questions and thank you ma'am for answering them at this point actually i am uh, reminded of a video that i saw uh, it was prepared by uh, you know uh, neve uh, literature festival mm-hmm. and uh, where uh, 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 a woman she uh, goes to a library and she uh, asks somebody where is the children section 
and then uh, begins a series of people asking seriously, seriously, seriously. I mean, nobody even imagines that there is a children's literature section uh, in a library. And then uh, the turn happens when we see uh, kids coming into the video and they say, uh, yes, seriously, this is serious for us. This is something serious. Why, mm -hmm. why do you, uh, you know, use that word in uh, uh, a different way? It is serious. It is something serious and you know it is to be studied uh, using those lenses and children are saying that this is please take this seriously please yeah. don't just uh, you know wave, wave it off that's <laughs> right such things yes so i see that shabina is asking is this the end of books are we so taken over by the entertainment quotient that it's the end of books Shabina, what do you think? You find it hard to get students to read, as we all do. Parents, teachers, children, we are always complaining that children are not reading enough. But where's the time for children to read? They have tuition, they have games, they have extracurricular activities. Um, they have 101 things uh, to do. We don't leave the children alone to have free time, to just hang out as we used to do. So um, it's a very tough question. So one way of getting children involved in reading is to set aside, say, 15 minutes. When as a family you, or as a class, you sit together and you read. No phones, no video games, no anything else. Um, no technology. You look at a text, not your phone screen. I don't have an answer, Shabina. If you come up with one, let me know. Ma'am, uh, I would just like to uh, say something here. Uh, that's a you know really wonderful thing that Shabina ma'am put forth. And uh, I was uh, reading uh, somewhere about this comparison between books and uh, films. And uh, I came across this uh, thought, uh, you know, uh, children may be moved away from books uh, to films because they found films, you know, more, uh, uh, what do we call, um, you know, they are uh, more visually appealing rather than uh, books and uh, uh, you know they are the story is often fast paced because they need to uh, finish the whole movie maybe uh, usually when we see animation films they are just of one and a half hours duration or something right. like that not more yeah. than that so usually they are fast paced so uh, you know I thought as uh, children have made a transition from books to films Maybe, you know, maybe uh, the films will help children go back to books because, you know, they will uh, keep that interest alive in the children for such stories. And then when authors see that, yes, children are getting attracted to movies more, maybe, you know, in their writings, they will have uh, such words which will create more, you know, those visual kind of uh, imaginings for children. Because I was really struck by one of our student pa panelists, Ritiman. He, he actually talked of having read Satyajit Ray. And yes. uh, he said, you know, uh, Satyajit Ray describes places in such a way that you don't need to go to those places and uh, you know, right. they, they just uh, uh, you can just uh, you know make tourist trips to those places just sitting wherever you are right. so uh, yes and uh, that, that was really interesting so maybe you know the writers will uh, take these cues from movies and uh, they will make the story fast paced or they will uh, make their stories more innovative so that, you know, when students uh, or children, they find that, yes, uh, you know, when we read the book, uh, it gives us the same kind of feeling, then uh, maybe they will go back to books, uh, you know, if, if, uh, because that is our concern that they are not reading much. But I had this that thought. Rupa, my my simple question is when you sit in front of a television screen or a movie screen, 
you're a passive watcher. When you are reading a book, you have to be involved. You have to be active. Even before illustrated books, children were creating pictures in their minds. And that's why um, when a book is made into a movie, it's always disappointing because ah. the way you had imagined it is not the way that someone else is showing it to you. So the interactive quality of a book is far greater, I think, than when you're passively watching. And I insist passively watching. Some people don't watch passively, yes. but I think they are the exceptions. When we watch, um, like that, it's because we want to chill out and relax and so forth. Yes. Um, and that's why, ma'am, we also brought in this virtual storytelling and we wanted to hear the children because I remember when I was playing, uh, you know, uh, Mario Brothers, when I was playing that game, I was in school at that time and yeah. my brother used to play it a lot. And so even I uh, played it. So I was really struck by all the colors that I could see. I was struck by, uh, you know, uh, how the bricks were arranged and how, uh, you know, the, uh, the things that had to be dodged by the brothers and what uh, brought them points and the storyline that followed that they had to rescue a princess uh, from a very uh, cruel king of uh, uh, another kingdom so uh, you know that that is why uh, we also included this in our discussions because as you said uh, perhaps films are spaces where uh, the viewers are a little passive but in video games you have to be active otherwise your uh, you know character will be killed immediately like max Payne, that was another video game which my <laughs> brother played you know where uh, people got killed uh, instantly you know if you're not paying attention uh, you get killed so and the story changes so that is no. why we brought in those yeah discussions. you're absolutely right um but you know, the video games teach you hand-eye coordination, but they are not teaching you moral lessons, which is why the children's books had been started. And the moral lessons became so boring that we had to move away from them. So how can we make these moral lessons interesting? Um, would and, uh, be our task, I think. And I see that Shabina has her hand up. Uh, yes. Very good evening to all, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for such a wonderful uh, and interesting session. I've been waiting all day for this. <laughs> My concern, as I said, uh, was basically because, you know, I teach here in Kashmir in a Tester University, and this year is part of revamping the syllabus yes. in part of popular literature. We thought the popularity of, uh, as ma'am just said, about a Harry Potter uh, series and the popularity of this among children or at least uh, you know, adolescent kids, we tried to incorporate the Sorcerer's Stone, which was the first in the series. Mm -hmm. And for two months, two months, believe me, I have been struggling uh, to get the students to read just the first 10 pages. Yeah. And these are not small children. These are uh, grown-up kids who think that it is better to go watch Harry Potter the movie right. rather you know as you were rightly saying books involve you they indulge you into thinking into visual yeah. imaginating they, they have to imagine everything themselves their mental growth that was the reason we had prescribed it yeah. but now after two months <laughs> I have a loss of words how to get them see I saw you as uh, you know I think uh, Pre, uh, Prajna ma'am rightly said that uh, we imitate our teachers. I saw you imitate the bindi I picked up. I am. <laughs> this is a part of my culture. I picked it up and I also put it on because that is how our culture has transmitted values and everything, morals. And, and everything. I copied Shatrupa ma'am when I that saw her point. wearing the bindi. Super, I said I've got to wear one it. too. I saw you <laughs> see it and I put it on and it yeah. seemed something, you know, uh, something worthy of copying but uh, as much as I take Harry Potter, you know, J.K. Rowling to the class, the kids today don't even, just 10 pages they have not been able to. But Shabina, I don't want to, I think you're right. Sometimes they're just not ready for it. This is reason sleep and they don't want to wake up. 
But I remember that when I first picked up 100 Years of Solitude, I thought it was unbearable. I could not move beyond the first three pages. And when I had to do it for a class that I was taking then, I could not put it down. And to date, it's one of my favorite books. So sometimes you just have to wait for the time to be right. And a book that is prescribed in a syllabus always has a negative feel to it because it's been prescribed. If you just said to them, here's Harry Potter, go read it, they might. But if you put it on your school syllabus, uh, and in one of the panels uh, yesterday, they talked about the difference reading in reading for a syllabus and for pleasure. And um, I agree that very few adults read for pleasure anymore either. So the children have nothing to imitate. But um, sometimes the time is not right for them. Maybe there are so many other things happening in their life. And was it Neharika who said one reads to create empathy? She reads to create empathy. And I'm yes, thinking that's exactly the purpose of reading. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, yes, uh, Vamsi Krishna, did you want to ask a question? I want to, sorry, are you asking a question, sir? Okay. I want to answer a question, a very important point that Shramita uh, Sarkar has Ray, Shramita Sarkar Ray has posed, which is video games are made purely on commercial purposes. But Shramita, so are movies like um, Home Alone. They are purely commercial. And as such, I would I would not count them in children's literature. But when I heard Pritam yesterday saying he learned responsibility and tricks of how to be self-sufficient from a movie like Home Alone, he's a very enlightened, awake watcher of movies. Because I was so blown away by its fun value that I didn't learn any lessons from it. So it's as everyone sees it. Yes, I see hands, but I don't see names. So, Ida, uh, Ida, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, please go ahead uh, with your question. Yeah, no issues, ma'am. I'm Ida. Okay, sorry, Ida. Please go ahead, ma'am. I have a, I have actually several uh, doubts which I which I could ask in the form of questions. One thing is, could you highlight the uh, uh, line that uh, really differentiates adult literature from the children's literature, either in terms of age or in terms of context, ma'am, which really marks the difference between uh, what is the line that marks the difference between adult literature or that which separates adult literature from uh, children's literature. And the other I one is... I can answer you immediately um, because... I'm unable to retain more than one question at a time. So I'll answer as we okay. go along. Sure, ma'am, um, sure. The, there is no line. It's a fluid um, difference, as I've tried to say. And the line depends on you. We were forbidden from reading books like uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover, for instance. It was meant to be very adult and at 13, uh, we thought, oh, this is supposed to be a very sexy book. So let's find the sexy books and read those. It was supposed to be very titillating for us. I went through the whole book and did not understand a word. And I thought, I wonder what the fuss is about, because it made no sense to me. So the lines you draw yourself. 
Nobody should draw those lines for you. A lot of people browse libraries, go alphabetically, read whatever they come, lay their hands upon, maybe because of the covers of the book. I know we are not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but we do. So I'm not a firm believer in lines, much more fluid than that. So not even in terms of age, ma'am, but no. if it is bit... No, okay. as I just told you, uh, if you're just picking up a book, you'll realize soon enough that yes. it's not appropriate for you. And either you'll read it to the end and not understand it, or you will understand it. And so what? So as far as I understand, I think uh, that the context could be the line that really differentiates. What do you mean by context? As you said, you know, in the book that you read, there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, sexual connotations. So, which, which obviously is not meant for children. But I read it as a child, Ida, and it made no difference to me. I'm not deeply marked by it. It hasn't ruined me. It hasn't enlightened me or hadn't enlightened me. So, what I'm saying is, to me, it makes no difference. Others maybe for, feel very strongly about it. I just happen not to. Maybe for today's uh, digital natives, uh, it may you know, wrongly influence them in no time. But Ida, if you're willing to be wrongly influenced, you can be in, wrongly influenced by the most simple of books. I mean, look at the fact that Enid Blyton, which was so popular when we were young, is banned in various libraries now. Why? Because she refers to a character as a Negro. In those days, it was acceptable. Today, it's not acceptable. Do you think that banning the book or removing the word has made any difference to people who are racist? They remain no. racist even now. Yes. So, <laughs> so I, got, I, I got it, ma'am. Yeah. Ma and as far as children's literature is concerned, the very word has a lot of issues in terms of its definition. So could you highlight the difference in the words, like, you know, child and childhood? Actually, it's Philip Aries, the French philosopher, who made that distinction? He said that with every age, every uh, age, the concept of childhood changes. As I told you in the 17th century, little girls and boys were meant to be seen and not heard. They were dressed like adults. They were supposed to behave like miniature adults. These days, you are aghast if you see a child in that kind of attire. And these days, the child will call the police on you if you dare to slap the child. I'm not at all in favor of, uh, you know, martial punishment like this. But I think you, you see how changes happen across the ages in different contexts. So not sure how to how better to answer your question if I've answered it at all. Okay, ma'am, I got it, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Another uh, clarification that I need is, uh, what do you think about the unreal representations in the children's fiction, ma'am? Do they uh, do do those unreal representations influence the children or you know? Um, uh, if whether it uh, in any way influences the children, Mama, any reading is uh, supposed to leave a positive impact. And nowadays, there are a lot of books which bring in social consciousness. You know, many children's books are eco pedagogical. That's all fine. But uh, um, the unreal uh, representations, uh, how uh, it, um, uh, no, it influences, influences the children Mama, in their perception. 
I don't. She wants I, to ask about fantasy. I think. Is that what you are asking, Ida? Um, uh, not uh, not uh, fully fantasy, ma'am. Even sometimes, you know, it is uh, it is not uh, lifelike uh, characters. So more than uh, no larger than uh, okay. life size okay. characters. So, Ida, you know that Harry Potter yes. has been banned in various libraries because yes. it shows the existence of witches and goblins mm. and yes, yes. stuff like that, which we know is not real. Mm. So that, of course, impacts children, but yes. it's not the unreality of Harry Potter's world of going through platforms uh, that influences the child. That is seen as fantasy and fun. Reality does not come into that. So what comes the impact of any literature on children does not have to be positive. And very often, you're not even aware that this is a negative or this is a positive. You just accept it as it goes. And children are actually very smart because they understand what is so-called real and what is not. These days, we have trigger warnings in our books before you assign a particularly shocking book. Uh, you warn parents, teachers, children that this book might have passages which, which will upset you. Mm. I'm not a great fan of trigger warnings, and this is purely personal, because yes. when you're reading, you're opening yourself to the world bad things happen in the world and you are reading it in the relative security of your home or your school and you know that maybe this won't affect me maybe it's happened before but it won't happen again because now i'm in a safe space so i just want to put in a plug for libraries here Libraries are wonderful, safe spaces for children who are neglected often by their parents. And librarians, even in a book like uh, Roald Dahl's Matilda, plays a really important part in allowing Matilda to grow up. So she enables her growth and intelligence. Okay, ma'am. Thank okay. you so much for patiently answering. No, Thank you not so much. At all. Thank you, Aida. Uh, that was this discussion was wonderful. And that's the power of questions. And uh, you know, we encourage children to ask questions. I mean, we right. should uh, and they should ask questions, and only then we will have so many things uh, you know, which we can see and which we can feel, which we can understand, only when there are so many questions. So yep. thank you, Aida. Aida. The pleasure is mine, ma'am. Thank you for this enlightening session. You have been doing a great job, especially for a research in children's literature like me. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, ma'am, there are a lot of responses in the chat box and I see Anita ma'am asked some uh, important questions. Anita ma'am, would you like to yeah, uh, why don't speak you to ma'am because loud. she wants yeah. to hear your voice. At least your voice and if you could I mean, if you could speak directly to ma'am, that would be great. Uh, I don't. Uh, or else, uh, Shri Priya, ma'am, can you read out her questions? Uh, okay, maybe she... I've seen it. So okay, can you okay. talk a little about the importance of children's magazines in earlier ages, like Wisdom, Chandamama, and Tinku, in creating an idea of balanced perception of the world, rather than a clear objective like with Amarchitra Katha? What were the ideologies they were trying to impress on their readers? Anita, I can't answer your excellent question. That's the truth of it. Because um, when I read Chanda Mama and Tinkle and all, I don't think it affected me very much. It was like, okay, this is fun, but no more than that. But when I talk to my students now, they have all grown up on Tinkle and Chanda Mama and said that that was their first uh, contact 
with literature and it was really important for them. So not Amar Chitra Katha, which had a great uh, clear ideology, but Chanda Mama, Tinkle, etc., were more fun. So they were more acceptable to, to younger children. I'm sorry, this is not a great answer to your question. But for the moment, this is the best I can do. And I will think more about it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, definitely. I mean, questions don't uh, end with just one answer. It actually yeah. leads us to many more questions. And uh, that is the beauty of it all. I also see uh, some comments, some interesting comments uh, made by Pragya, ma'am. Uh, you know, and I would like really like her to uh, speak uh, if she can, if she can, uh, you know, turn on her audio and speak to ma'am directly. Actually, Pragya ma'am was uh, writing about uh, her experiences of uh, how uh, a person, uh, you know, uh, told her that uh, his favorite books are, uh, you know, uh, those Shakespeare by, and Chetan Yeah, Shakespeare and yes. Chetan Bhagat. I and saw that. The person she is in my head. <laughs> Please, Pragya ma'am, please uh, come on and speak to me. It is a strange juxtaposition. <laughs> Definitely, I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> but yeah, the, these were the two names he was familiar with. And uh, I am thankful to his uh, like syllabus designer that at least uh, the person ensured that uh, this reader knew Shakespeare along with Chetan Bhagat. <laughs> <laughs> it has been such a pleasure listening to you, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> I'm seeing a question uh, by Suresh Patil, which says children's literature as a genre is determined by adults, uh, exclamation mark. So, Suresh, do you think that's untrue? Why the explanation mark? Why the exclamation mark? Is Suresh there or gone? So just to reiterate then that children's literature is determined by adults. Many people have said it's a way that adults colonize children. So that's a fairly harsh critique, but that's what some people have said. Okay. Shamita Sarkarre says, uh, in reality shows, a child acts and imitates like adults and they are applauded for doing so. Isn't this an example where a child is looked upon as a miniature adult? Um, yes and no, Shamita. In a way, yes, um, it, he's looked, the child is looked upon as a miniature adult. But on the other hand, the adult is showing off, basically. When we adults make our children do certain things, sing a song in public or whatever, the beauty is reflected on us, not on the child, I think. So I don't know. What do you think about that? Mahima is talking about Helen Keller and then says, should we consider children's literature for just their moral or social development? Again, Mahima, I'm not really big on these strict boundaries. Um, I think it all gets mixed up in the jumble. So children's literature is great for social development. It's wonderful for moral development. It's great for linguistic skills, building a vocabulary, acculturation. I don't know. How can we say which is which?
We have Pramita, ma'am. Ma'am, um, I'd like to say here that perhaps uh, adults are in some way afraid of children, which is why they try to direct their reading a certain way. You know, for them, children are unknowables, unquantifiables. I remember watching a film, I do not know the, I do not remember the name, but in their, uh, the babies, the infants, they had their own language. They mm -hmm. were speaking very logically. They were mm -hmm. making sense. They were laughing at the adults and uh, they said, okay, my parents are approaching. Now we have to act cute so that they think of us as help, helpless infants. So <laughs> immediately when the parents approach, the child goes gaga goo goo and uh, the <laughs> adults completely melt. They say, oh, and that's yeah, it. I think that is boss baby or something like that. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I still remember. remember. Yeah, I think children are smarter than we give them credit for being. <laughs> Because of the uh, dictum of the adults that children should be seen and not heard, children manage to observe a lot. They are way more perceptive yep. than we give them credit. Absolutely. Absolutely. No more questions. I can't read it. Okay, anything. if we have more questions, if anyone else wants to ask, ma'am, please do so. Otherwise, we have already touched. It's already 8.30. Uh, 30. 30. So uh, definitely, if anyone is interested to ask uh, any question, please go ahead or else we'll wind up. Okay, uh, so ma'am, I was really happy that you uh, brought in Studio Ghibli because uh, even I enjoy, uh, you know, watching uh, those movies and I like the kind of uh, animation that we find in those particular movies because, yes. uh, you know, uh, as you said, there the transitions uh, of emotions are very graded and uh, it has a different feel altogether. I remember watching uh, Arietti. It is also a Studio Ghibli uh, film or Howl's Moving Castle. These two films I remember, which uh, you know were uh, from Studio Ghibli. And uh, the way those sketches have been animated, I find them really, uh, you know, very uh, appealing. And yes. uh, when I said uh, those things about movies and uh, video games, I was actually hoping it was a, a, a voice that was hoping that, uh, you know, if uh, children are watching movies uh, more and more, or if they are playing video games, maybe there is something in those, uh, you know, movies or video games, which will keep that interest alive in narratives, in stories, and that will help them make a turn towards uh, books. Because ultimately as you said uh, you know children should read books and there is no other uh, substitute to reading correct yeah yes, so. but it's so easy to get addicted to the screen that's true that's but true you that's don't true. really come back to books so maybe we can hope uh, that you know if there are adults if there are elders they can somehow channel this uh, you know interest or this uh, you know that uh, attraction into something else, maybe they can help this. And that was one of our aims in asking the children about video games that uh, we, we could understand them through their language so Correct. that we can use the same language and tell them that, yeah. yes, uh, these things you can find in you know books also. Please see uh, that these are things that you uh, see there and that's why you should see. Yeah, uh, no, I think that was a great idea to include all this and to widen the scope. Hmm. Ma'am, I would also like to share something as uh, children's literature is really guided by the adults. Here I would like to mention Anne Frank's diary, which was yeah. prescribed by, uh, by CBSA for class 10. So it clearly mentions that uh, it was uh, the way we have read it. It is actually written by her aunt and deliberately she has deleted some of the portions 
which Anne Frank has she might have added in the original text. So, uh, it, especially one of the chapter when she talks about her love life. Mm -hmm. So it's really means when we are discussing in the classroom and all. So we feel a little bit uh, that she might have added something more, but then deliberately it was. Uh, not included by, I, by by her aunt while it was published. Her and father. that too, it was with her per, the permission of her father also. Yeah, so it that was again, the father uh, who excised uh, certain lines so, and chapters and yeah. paragraphs of the book. So that again uh, clarifies that children literature is again guided by the adults also. Yeah, adults yeah. only. Thank you. Yeah. And one more thing that I would like to tell when such a day will come when children will be allowed to share their own creativity, imagination in their own words. I'm still waiting for such a, apart from Anne Frank book, which was translated by her aunt, because still today, I think an adult and writer, uh, how much they try, they can never delve into the creativity or the imagination or level of the understanding and thinking of a child. So that is still a long way to go in children literature where it will be completely suffice the name of children literature. Thank you. But actually, you know, the books that we adults write are the books that build children into who they become. You remember the tabula rasa? It gets filled up by what we fill them up with. So exactly, if we exactly. I do up, agree. I do agree, ma'am. Because the first book that I read. Pygmalion, that was the first book or as you two mentioned about Chanda Mama and Tinker. Yeah. I clearly remember we used to rush to the library to read those books. Right. Because in the, in the context of completing the syllabus, never the teacher allowed us to do or read something out of the syllabus. Correct. So that library was the small window in yeah. our childhood that allowed us to read something out of the syllabus. And Absolutely. I am so disappointed that in today's world, the children go to the libraries means uh, they just want to uh, discuss among themselves something instead of reading something. So we as an English teachers, we have to really inculcate in them that all the values and everything the book can teach. Uh, it's I mean, It cannot be comparable to any video games or the movies, though I, I agree that I have watched Three Idiots a number of times and I love that movie and I can watch that movie n number of times and so many things I have learned from three idiots and I keep on mentioning the movie in the class also yeah so some way it is somewhere related and linked also absolutely yeah very much so thank you so much sure. ma'am that was uh, interesting and uh, I think uh, we should uh, wind up now. Uh, and uh, it has been a really amazing uh, session. Uh, definitely, we, we talked of, uh, you know, how it all began, uh, the journey from there. And yeah. uh, we moved on to, uh, you know, how uh, films have, uh, you know, made that transition from yeah. words. And, yeah. uh, you know, we hope that again, that transition from films will happen and children will right. go towards reading. That was uh, our purpose. And ma'am, uh, really, we loved your slides and uh, we, we thank uh, your, uh, you know, your little helper who has uh, <laughs> helped you, uh, you know, make such beautiful and colorful slides. And I will pass that on. <laughs> yes, please, please do it, ma'am. And we are, we are really grateful to you, uh, you know, for uh, ensuring that this uh, was a relaxed session that was important because uh, I, I must admit now that uh, you know we have come to the end of the session I must admit that you know when it begins uh, it, it, you know I, I am a little nervous uh, but as the sessions go on uh, I feel at ease and yes, then I feel yes. like uh, you know sharing everything that comes right. to mind so yeah uh, you know thank you for putting all of us at ease and uh, just uh, uh, you know, looking at you uh, was such a calming uh, experience. So Thank you, Shatarupa. And I hope you'll get some sleep and not been, be awoken <laughs> by my endless emails saying now this, now that. 
And thank you. No, ma'am, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I will definitely, I'll, uh, you know, be in touch. And if there is yes. any other, uh, you know, event of this sort, then I'll, uh, we will love to uh, have you again. Thank you. Uh, and I would love to participate. <laughs> thank you. And I must especially thank you for watching our sessions with the kids and in your deliberation, referring to uh, those points, because that, you know, uh, now I feel that our purpose of having included those sessions has been served because, yeah. uh, you know, you actually uh, picked out those key points, which perhaps we wanted to make. And, uh, you know, you put it before the audience and that was really nice of you. And I must mm. thank you for that. No, it, they uh, were wonderful sessions and I was so pleased to watch them. I thought these kids have done all my work. What am I going to come and do now? <laughs> So, thank you and thank you to the whole IFS team that this has been a very interesting session so I thank my uh, you know co-moderator Shri Priya ma'am and I thank all the participants uh, for uh, you know making this whole session so interesting with their ideas right. and uh, yes we do thank IFS for giving us this opportunity yes and thank you, everyone. Thank you for the kind introduction. That was very <laughs> gracious of you. Yes. Okay, ma'am. Thank, ma you, so thank much, you so much. Not and uh, wishing everyone a good night. And yes. we should end it here. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night.